we come now to Genesis 16. In chapter 15, you remember Abram, who's now waited several more years on a child who hasn't come, has suggested that maybe what God meant was that he would adopt the biological children of his servant, Eliezer of Damascus. God says, no, the children I'm going to give you will be your biological children. They'll come from your own body. After they wait even longer, in chapter 16, Sarah has an idea. What she suggests is that, well, maybe God's going to give us children through your body, but not my body. Just as there was a practice in the ancient Near East so that the master could adopt the children of a servant, so could the woman of the household adopt the children of one of her servants. And so she suggested that her husband treat her maiden, Hagar, an Egyptian woman, like his wife. And by treating her like his wife, maybe they would have a child and maybe this would be the way that God would fulfill the promise. Well, this is not a high point in Sarah's life and it's not a high point in Abram's life. You can imagine that any man would be easily led to a plan which would mean that he would get to spend the night with a young girl over and over. And that's what happened. And it, it says in chapter 16, verse 1, that Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. Sarah said to Abram, Behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Now, um, there are several things here. First of all, in the beginning, we may think that we have a better plan than God. But at the end, we will discover that we do not. In the beginning, we may discover, we may believe that we can pick out a gift for ourselves which is better than the gift the Lord wants to give us. But at the end, we will discover not only that the, the gift God picks is better than the gift we pick, but we will discover that we don't even like the gift that we picked, that it turns out to be a bad thing, not a good thing. If you choose one end of the road, you also choose the other end of the road. What that means is if you begin on a path, you'll also end on that path. The problem is no matter how much we know about the beginning of a path, we may not know anything about what that path is like at the end. And the reality is God knows much more about the end of the path than we do. One of the many reasons why it's best to trust God. Now this plan leads to the birth of a son. And immediately when her maid Hagar began to expect a child, she adopted a different attitude toward her mistress, Sarah. She believed that she now had a more special relationship with Abram than Sarah did. And therefore, she didn't have to humble herself like a servant in front of Sarah anymore because she was able to give Abram something that Sarah was not able to give him, namely a son. And so this obviously hurts Sarah deeply. And by verse 5, she says to Abram, May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms. When she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. Now, she blames Abram. It was her idea. The whole plan was her plan. Abram is guilty for going along with it. Obviously, there were aspects of the plan which were very appealing to Abram. 
But now there's a mess, a big, big mess. And uh, Abram says, you can do anything with her that you want to do. And uh, Sarah treated her so badly that she ran away. When she ran away, the Lord appeared to her. Now, um, it says that the angel of the Lord appeared to her in verse 9. Um, it would take me a long time to prove biblically what I'm about to say. I'll go ahead and, and um, share the doctrine with you, and uh, maybe I won't have time to prove it, but you can study it out on your own, and you can determine if the biblical evidence is sufficient to justify the point of view I'm about to share. There's a special term in Hebrew called the Malach Yahweh, the Malach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. The word malach means messenger. That's what the word angel means in Hebrew, malach, and in Greek, angelos. It means messenger. Normally, when we refer to angels, we are referring to created beings. We talked about this yesterday. Angels, elect angels, fallen angels, cherubim, seraphim, and the archangel. But sometimes when the, word, when the phrase Malach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, is used, the reference is not to a created being. When you study the way the angel of the Lord is spoken to and what the angel of the Lord says, we come to the conclusion that the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. We come to the conclusion that the visible God in the New Testament is Jesus of Nazareth, God the second person. We come to the conclusion that the visible God in the Old Testament is also God the second person, the Malach Yahweh. Now, we're going to see this again in Genesis 18. We're going to see it again in Genesis 32. And if you only have one example, like the example in Genesis 16, maybe the argument is not very strong. But when you put all the passages together, and when you look at a passage, for instance, like Judges 13, we discover that the, the Malach Yahweh is more than a mere angel, more than a created being. I think we talked about this when we talked about the Gospel of John. I know we did. Do you remember the verse in John 1, John 1, 18, which says, No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten has explained Him, has shown Him. Well, I mean, that's a radical thing for John to say. No one has seen God at any time. Moses evidently saw God, but maybe he didn't see his face. Isaiah certainly saw God in the famous passage in Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I've been warned that I need to read the verses that I refer to. So let's just, read, let's just read two or three verses together so that we don't lose those who are watching on the video. First of all, John 1.18. John 1, verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. When we study John together, I paraphrase that verse in this way. No one has ever seen God except, of course, when they saw Christ. Isaiah 6, one of the most um, famous 
appearances of God or sightings of God in the Old Testament, in the Bible. Isaiah 6.1, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. So in Isaiah 6 we read, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. And in John 1.18 we see, no man has seen God at any time. But then he says, the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he's talking about Jesus, He has explained Him. He has shown Him. He has revealed Him. Now, one more verse in the New Testament before we go back to the Old Testament. John chapter 12. This is the passage about Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. Um, On Palm Sunday. Um, John, in John 12, 40, quotes Isaiah 6. He says, uh, he quotes the verses a little bit after the verse that I read. He says in John 12, 39, For this cause they could not believe, for Isaiah has said. Then in verse 90, he quotes a portion of Isaiah 6. In verse 41, he says, These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Now, John is referring to the glory of Christ. So what he's saying is that the one that John saw was Christ. Now, in this passage of Scripture, it says in Genesis 16, that the angel of the Lord found Hagar and spoke to her. He tells her in verse 9 to return to Sarah and to submit uh, yourself to to her authority. But look what he says in verse 10. He's speaking to Sarah. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants. Can an angel do that? Is this something an angel does? He then, he then makes a prophecy of Ishmael and what Ishmael will be like. And then in verse 13, it says about Hagar, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. Well, it says the angel of the Lord who spoke to her. But in verse 13, it said it was the Lord who spoke to her. And what does she say about the one who spoke to her? You are a God who sees. You are the God who sees. But she actually gives God a new name, as Abraham does in Genesis 22. Um, There's a famous song in English by Michael Card called El Shaddai, God Almighty. And he says, to the outcast on her knees, you are the God who really sees. And when Michael Card wrote that song, he was referring to this passage in Genesis 16. Um, So, there's strong evidence, and that's just from this passage, but there are other passages. There are even other passages that we will see in the book of Genesis, which indicate this is, this is not a mere angel. This is not a created being. This is a special messenger from God, the uncreated second person, God Himself. Okay. It says in verse 16 at the end of the chapter that Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. So he's been waiting 11 years. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.